My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, around this time of the year, as we're about to start Ramadan, we tend to hear the ayat, the verses from Surah Al-Baqarah that the Imams will read in the Salat about the ayat of as siyam from Surah Al-Baqarah. So what are some of the meanings and some of the things that we benefit from these ayat? Before we mention some of the benefits, something amazing, if you look at where these ayat come in Surah Al-Baqarah, from, surah, from verses 183 to 187, before that, in verse 177, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the al-birr, righteousness, and what is true righteousness. And then after that, from verses 178 to verse 203, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions five different types of ahkam, of rulings. All of these rulings are rather difficult. And they need sabr and patience to be able to accomplish them. And if you look at verse 177, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about what is al-birr, what is righteousness? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of the verse, وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَفِي الضَّرَّاءِ وَحِينَ الْبَأْسِ The ones who are patient at the time of poverty and at the time of difficulty and at the time of battle. Allah then said, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُتَّقُونَ That these are the ones who have been truthful. And these are the ones who are the muttaqun, the ones who have the taqwa, the pious ones. And then the ahkam, the rulings start after that. First of all, talking about al-qisas. And what happens if someone were to kill someone in Islam, what does he get in return? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about al wasiya the bequest, what you do with your money at the time of death, after your death, what happens to your money. And then the verses of the siyam start. And after the verses of the siyam, the verses of fighting in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start. And then the verses of al-hajj. And all five of these different rulings in Islam, all of them are very, very difficult. And they need sabr. And something else amazing, subhanAllah, if you look at these verses and the way that each one of these verses ends, all of them end with a similar message. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said at the end of the verse of al-birr, of al-taqwa, that ulaika hum al-muttaqoon, that these are the ones who are the pious ones. Also at the end of the verse of al-qisas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that la'allakum tattaqoon, that perhaps you will obtain the taqwa. And also when you look at the verses of al wasiya at the end, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the big question, what happens to the money? He said, haqqan al muttaqin That it's a duty upon the muttaqin, those who have taqwa. And in the verses of al-qital, the verses of fighting, and before that, the verses of al-siyam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the goal, and what is the objective of the siyam, He said, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That you may obtain taqwa. That's in verse 183. And at the end of the verses of the siyam as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِهِ لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ And like this, Allah shows His ayat to the people so that they will have the taqwa. And the verses of fighting in the path of Allah, Allah said, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُتَّقِينَ And fear Allah and know that Allah is with those who have the taqwa. All of this coming to teach us, my dear brothers and sisters, that the taqwa is the objective of these ibadat, of these acts of worship, and that the taqwa is the only way that we will be able to, uh, to be able to implement and act upon these ahkam and these rulings. SubhanAllah. Every single ruling of these five rulings that Allah mentions, He also mentions them with the taqwa. And the hajj at the well is at the end, 
تحشرون, and fear Allah and know that you are returning to Him. The same thing. The taqwa and that you're returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these ahkam, they end with the taqwa. Also, these verses show us something about the history of the siyam. And if you look in verse 184, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that in the beginning, fasting was made something that was optional to the ummah. Meaning that if you wanted to fast, you fasted. And if you wanted to pay the ransom or the fidya to feed a poor person for each day, you had the option to do. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَن تَصُومُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ And to fast, it's better for you. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it fault compulsory upon all of the ummah when he sent down, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُومُ That whoever witnesses from you the month, then let him fast it. That he must fast it. And the Ramadan became fought upon this ummah the second year of Hijrah. And the Prophet والسلام, fasted nine Ramadans before he passed away. Also, from the history of the Siyam, when you look into verse 187, it shows us the ruling of what happened in the beginning. And this was narrated in Sahih al Bukhari and in other books as well, where it was said that the companions of the Prophet وسلم, in the beginning, that the ruling was that if you fell asleep, that if you fell asleep before you ate after Maghrib, that then you had to continue fasting to the next day. To the next day when? To the next Maghrib. And about 24 hours more or 23 hours more. And so one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, who was out working on his farm in the heat during the day, and he came home exhausted. And all of us know that feeling when you come home from work and you're exhausted. He asked his wife, do you have any food? And she said, I don't have anything, but I will go and look for something and bring something back to you. She went back and she found that he had fallen asleep. Meaning that now he cannot have anything to eat. He can't be with his spouse. He has to fast all the way into the next Mughrib. The next day it became too intense for him until he fainted and he passed out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down verse 187 where he made it, halal, made it halal to come to our spouses and he told us then you eat and drink until the thread of dawn becomes clear from the thread of the darkness of the night and then you continue to fast until the sunset also in these ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us many of the different ahkam and the rulings of fasting. From that is what to do when we travel or if we're sick and we're fasting. And this happens to a lot of us all the time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ That whoever from you is traveling or he's sick, then he makes it up from other days. And it's important to know, my dear brothers and sisters, what are the rulings regarding being sick when we're fasting? What are the rulings of traveling? And which one is better? Which one is permissible? And if we're going to travel, there's several different scenarios. First of all, that we find that fasting is actually easier for us. An example of someone who sleeps on the plane, he's gonna travel from here to his country during Ramadan, and he knows that as soon as he gets on the plane, Bismillah, he wakes up and he's in his country. He's going here, an air-conditioned car, an air-conditioned car is gonna pick him up there, and she said, it's, it's easier for me just to fast. So here we say it's better for you to fast in this situation, if it's going to be easier for you. The second possibility is that it's going to be challenging, but it's possible. It can be tough, but it's possible. You can do it. You can, you can, it's going to be tough for me to fast as I travel, but I can do it. I can bear it. Here we say it's better for you to break your fast. It's permissible to fast, but it's better for you to break your fast. The third scenario is that you're traveling and it harms you. It becomes harmful. It becomes something that you can't bear. Here we say it's haram for you to fast. 
You're not allowed to fast and you must break your fast if it's going to harm you when you're traveling. Similar, when we are sick, and this is very important, because this Ramadan also, it's gonna be a time of weather change. It's gonna get a bit hotter. People might get little colds and things like that. So what is the criteria to know if we can break our fast or not? When it comes to the type of sicknesses, as the scholars mentioned, because some scholars say any type of sickness, no matter what it is, no matter how small it is, but this opinion, as, the, as many scholars mentioned, this is a weak opinion. And the strongest view is that if it's something that doesn't really harm you, you have a runny nose, a little bit of a toothache, a little bit of a headache, which everyone gets in the first couple of days of fasting anyways, that here it's not permissible for you to break your fast because this is not harming you. There's something normal that happens throughout the year and something that you can handle. And this situation you must fast. Another scenario is that if I fast, it's going to harm me. Harm me by increasing the sickness I, that I have or making the cure come later, make, delaying the cure. I mean, it's, it's going to make the sickness last longer if I were to fast. In this situation, it is haram upon us to fast. Just like certain individuals who have certain diseases, that when they fast, it in, that it causes them harm. Some of them who have diabetes, some of them who have problems with, 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 with their liver or what have you, and they need to drink fluids, then it becomes haram upon them to fast if it is harming them. Pay attention to that. The third possibility is that we might face some difficulty in fasting when we're sick, but it doesn't cause the sickness to increase. We say in this situation, it's better to break your fast. It's permissible to fast, but it's more cruel to fast, and it's better for you to break your fast in this scenario, as the scholars mentioned. Also from the rulings that we gain from this, in verse 184, is when it comes to those who are the elder, or those who have chronic illnesses. And this is very important because the verse was first revealed to show that you had the option to either fast or to feed a poor person for each day. But the ruling continued, not for the entire ummah, but for certain individuals, such as the elderly and those who have chronic illnesses. These who do not have the ability to fast and will not have the ability to fast. The difference between someone who is sick and he's going to get cured after Ramadan a month or two, he has to make it up. But the person who has a chronic illness, he'll never be able to fast. Or due to old age and weakness, uh, uh, they'll never be able to fast. These individuals do not fast and they feed a poor person for each day. And the amount that they feed is a half of a sa'a, which is a little over a kilo. Some scholars say up to about a kilo and a half, a kilogram and a half of the food that they eat in the country. So here, for example, rice. A kilo and a half of rice for each day, that's how much they would give for the person who is going to, who doesn't have the ability to fast. Also from the rulings that the scholars talked about, when you look at these ayat, is the woman who breaks her fast in order because she is pregnant or because she is breastfeeding. She breaks her fast because she is pregnant or, she, or she's breastfeeding. What does she have to do? Here the scholars differ. And it's very important to understand this because there's three different opinions of the scholars. Some of them say that she just makes up her fast with nothing else. Some say there's a difference if she was concerned about herself or if she was scared for her child. She said, I'm okay, I can fast, but my child's not gonna have any milk. So I'm concerned for him and his well-being, therefore I'm, I'm, I'm breaking my fast. They say there's a difference here. And other scholars, they say all she has to do is feed a poor person. She doesn't even make up the fast. But the most authentic view and the strongest view when you look at the evidence, and this is the opinion of Imam, the view of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, and the view of our Mashaykh, Shaykh Mbaz and Shaykh Nuthaymin rahimullah, that the woman who broke her fast, whether it's for herself or for her child, that she only has to make up her fast. She doesn't have to pay a penalty and she only makes up her fast. This is the strongest view. The question comes now, what happens if she's pregnant year after year? Or if she's pregnant and she's breastfeeding, she couldn't make up her fast before the next Ramadan comes. Does she have to pay a penalty then? We say no, because she had a valid reason. 
for not making up her fast. Therefore, whenever she has the ability in the future, even if it's two, three years from now, she makes up her fast when she has the ability to do so, and there's no penalty upon her with that, inshallah ta'ala, because she had a valid reason. And the scholar said, because they take the same rule and the same hukum as the one who is sick or the one who is traveling, because they didn't have the ability to fast, and she is the same, inshallah ta'ala. Also, from the rulings that we learn and we gain from these ayat is that we only start the month of Ramadan when we see the moon, not by the calendar, as it's become famous in some countries around the world, where they don't go out to sight the moon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear in these ayat, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْهُ That whoever sees the month from you, then let him fast it. And we know this from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who told us as well in the sunnah, that if it comes to the 29th of Sha'ban, we're supposed to go out and look for the moon. And if we don't see it, then we finish. We keep, we keep, we keep on the day of Sha'ban, make it 30 days, and then we start Ramadan the day after. It's clear in different hadith from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also from the rulings that we gain and we learn from these ayat is the time of fasting. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear, to eat and drink until the thread of the dawn becomes clear from the thread of the darkness of night and then continue to fast until the sunset. And also from the ahkam, from the rulings that we gain is the relationships that we have with our spouses if we're going to make itikaf during the last 10 days that we stay away from having relations with our spouses. And do not have relations with them when you are making itikaf in the masajid. These are some of the ahkam, some of the rulings that we gain from these ayat that we hear time and time again. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن والسنة ونفعا وياكم بما فيهما من الآيات والحكمة أقول قول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على نبي مصطفى وبعد My dear brothers and sisters in Islam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these ayat tells us that these days that are coming up to us these days that have been prescribed for us, just like they were prescribed for the nations before us, that they are ayyam ma'dudat, that they are a specific number of days, either 29 or 30 days. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in these ayat that these are blessed days, days of barakah, the days of the Quran, the days of guidance. شَهُ وَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيَّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ That these are, the day, these are the days, شَهُ رَمَضَانَ that the Qur'an was sent down in as sources of, as the Qur'an was sent down as sources of guidance to the people. And the criterion between what was is truth and falsehood. These are days of blessings. Also, in these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us what is the goal of fasting? What is the objective? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That you obtain the taqwa. And also he shows us at the end of verse 185, what is the wisdom behind fasting itself, the month of Ramadan. The wisdom of, fa- the wisdom of fasting and the goal of fasting is the taqwa. What is the goal of Ramadan. What do we want to gain from Ramadan? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He wants ease for us, He doesn't want difficulty. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Three objectives, three goals that we hope to gain from Ramadan. That we finish the iddah. That we finish the idda, this prescribed time of day, a training session for us, a yearly boot camp, 29 to 30 days, to revive 
our spiritual needs in our life. And that we can be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make the takbir, and then to be thankful for the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us with Islam and the blessing that He has given us through helping us revive ourselves spiritually in this blessed month during the month of Ramadan. All of these things, my dear brothers and sisters, remind us that we are the ones who are benefiting from this siyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want difficulty for us. Yurid Allah bikum al yusr wa la yurid bukum al usr. Allah makes it clear in the ayah. Yurid Allah bikum al yusr wa la yurid bikum al usr. That Allah wants ease for you. He doesn't want to make difficulty for you. He told us it's ayyam ma'dudat. It's only a specific number of days. All of this to remind us that we are the ones that are benefiting. We are the ones who need this fast. And that's why we have to prepare ourselves as we enter into the month of Ramadan. And as we finish today's khutbah, I'm going to give you two practical pieces of advice from these ayat that we need to focus on if we're going to benefit from fasting the month of Ramadan. Two practical pieces of advice. First of all, is that we prepare ourselves and we set goals. What do we want to accomplish during the month of Ramadan? And the best way to do this, and I say this to the brothers time and time again, year in and year out, the best way to accomplish this is to go old school, uh, to get out the pen and the paper and write down the goals, write down the objectives. What do I want to do? How much Qur'an do I want to do? What do I want to do with my salat? What do I want to do with sadaqah? What am I going to do with my zakat if I pay my zakat in Ramadan? What, what, what other actions am I going to do during the month of Ramadan? Do I want to read a certain book? Write the objectives down. Aim high. Pay attention. Aim high, but don't put something that you know you're not going to accomplish. Put something that is a high objective, but it's something you can accomplish inshallah ta'ala. And then strive to accomplish it during the month of Ramadan. Go back to what you have written down time and time again. And the second tool that's going to help us is that we have to eliminate all of the distractions and all that's going to come between us and benefiting from Ramadan. And for most of us, the main thing that's going to come between us and benefiting is what? Our mobile devices. Wasting our time on social media. And people might say, but there's a lot of beneficial things. People are going to, there's things I need to know about Ramadan. Go on your laptop and look for those things. And go straight to those things and then turn it off. Delete the social media apps from your device during the month of Ramadan. Just for Ramadan. Just, just 30 days or 29 days. It's possible. You're not going to die. You'll make it to the end of Ramadan. In fact, you're going to find that you revive something in your life and you benefit. Because these devices have come between us, Wallahi, and coming in between us benefiting from our deen. We're so busy. And shaitan gets us. Say, Ya let's look at something. We'll read the Quran from the app instead of having our little Quran in our pocket. We have it on the telephone. And then we find we're on WhatsApp. Then we find that we're on Facebook. And then we're on Twitter. And then we have to go back to doing something else and we never read anything from the Quran. And then we read some ayah from the Qur'an. And then we get a message or notification on the top. And this is very important when brothers ask, is it permissible for us to read the Qur'an from our telephones? We say it's permissible, but you need to do one of two things. Make sure that the notifications are turned off on all of the apps. So you don't get something that distracts you. Or you put it on airplane mode. Because how disrespectful is it that you're reading the message to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah. You're reflecting and then you get a notification from someone on Facebook that you don't even know. And then you turn off the Quran and you go to go look, look to see what they said about your picture. Subhanallah. How disrespectful is that? Imagine you're with your boss at work and you just he's talking to you and you turn out the telephone and you start to look at your notification on Facebook. Would that be acceptable? We're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
He's sending you messages in the Quran from above the seven skies. And here you're reading this message and then you see something more important, a comment from someone you don't know on Facebook. Allah. So my dear brothers if we, and sisters, if you really want to benefit, don't forget the ayat. When those who want the Jannah, they're the ones who are racing for it. The sabiqeen, those who are striving for it. If we really want to get to Jannah, and we really want to benefit from this month that has one night, which is khayrum min alfi shahr, which is better than 1,000 months, then we need to eliminate that which distracts us. And I will mention something as I'm ending today. A video which I did last Ramadan, which I uploaded this morning on my YouTube channel. And you can go and check it out. How we benefit as Muslims during Ramadan from the king, LeBron James. And people are surprised. How can we benefit from this non-Muslim basketball player during Ramadan? Look at his discipline and what he does. And I mentioned in the video, when the playoffs come, look how he changes his lifestyle. And this is the same exact thing that we need to do if we're going to benefit from this blessed month. We need to benefit from what he does and the discipline that he does to achieve from the dunya, which is to win basketball games. We need to do the same thing and have the same discipline if we're going to win the Jannah and the hereafter, inshallah ta'ala. ثُمَّ يَعْلَمُوا رَحِمَ لِلَّهِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَمَرُكُمْ بِأَمْرُ بَدَأَ بِي بِنَفْسِهِ ثُمَّ ثَنَّ بِي مَلَائِكَةِ الْكِرَامِ فَقَالَ عَزَ وَجَلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَةُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا وَيَقُولَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مَنْ صَلَّى عَلَيْهِ بِوَاحِدَةٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهَا بِعَشْرَةٍ